we talked about kind of considerations, before, you know, how you consider how you're going to kind of structure your event, what kind of events you're going to do, a little bit about the platform. Now we're going to go into some more sort of uh, planning details and more uh, considerations and details about specific platforms. One thing for sure is, is these virtual events have taken sort of more effort and time, it seems so far, than most people think it's going to. So definitely give yourself ample time. There's nothing worse than having to change things or, or do things last minute. Um, as I've been doing more and more of these virtual events with my clients who have done live events in the past, they say, well, what is it like executing these virtual events? You know, how does this work? They kind of want to get an idea of, of how it goes. And I, I like to tell them, well, it's long. It's actually when the event is happening, it's usually sort of long chunks of kind of boredom. And then there's going to be cheer moments of absolute terror sprinkled throughout. And that's kind of what it's like executing these, um, even if they're planned well, because you're relying on a lot of technology and a lot of people to kind of do things at a certain time. So we had that poll about these platforms. Um, and these are some platforms that have become popular for virtual events. And they may be one component of it. Uh, they may be, um, or you may be doing your whole event in these. It kind of depends. I'm going to just switch the poll up quick there. So it looked like Zoom was a very popular one based on the, the poll I just looked at. So left to right, what you're seeing here is Cisco WebEx, then Zoom, then Skype in the bottom left, and then Microsoft Teams. And all of these platforms um, have been around for a while, but now they're all sort of catching wind that, oh, people are trying to use our systems for virtual events, right? Not just meetings, not just conferences or video calls or even just webinars, but events. So you'll see they're all kind of starting to add more features now for that. Um, I would say first, when you're looking at these, consider what you already have. If you already have Zoom, Zoom can work for a lot of the components you may want to do for a virtual event. So first kind of look at what you have, then look at what is the cost going to be, what are the features, and what are kind of the accessibility going to be for these different things. Um, and another important part is kind of the web, uh, your, your online stuff. Um, some people choose to do a virtual event approach that is really just purely based on their website. Um, uh, and I'm gonna show some examples of those too where we've built custom websites and the whole website is really around this event. So with the WordPress platform, which is what we use for pretty much everything, there's a lot of plugins available for virtual events. There's a lot of third-party tools, whether scheduling tools or video tools. And then there's systems like YouTube. For instance, if you're streaming a, a gala, so you're just going to have your virtual gala, many times YouTube or Vimeo is a good choice for that. And there's plugins, too, to integrate that content into your website. Uh, the nice thing about kind of having a website approach for your virtual event is you can have a single destination, one place for people to go to maybe, you know, donate, buy something at an auction, watch the content, kind of interact and do all of that. So here's a couple examples. The first one is South Dakota Healthcare Association. They have a large virtual event we're helping produce. And then Minnesota Corn Growers, um, the event that they participate in was canceled. So they, we spun up a website for them, which is just a virtual booth uh, where they usually have four people at their booth you can talk to. Uh, now they've got um, just four buttons where you can bring up sort of a virtual experience where you can watch video from the people and ask questions and stuff. So some other very important tips with the platform. Um, all platforms are going to have some gotchas. So uh, the first item here, learning the platform really well, and especially ahead of time before you plan on executing your event, is pretty important. Um, all, you know, all the platforms are going to have certain gotchas. For instance, Zoom. Uh, most of you, it sounds like, are fairly familiar with Zoom. So Zoom has two major components. They have meetings and they have webinars, and those two things have different features. Uh, you know, meetings have breakout rooms. Webinars don't. Um, Webinars have uh, polls, meetings don't. So there's different things in different parts of the platform and, and you'll find gotchas in all of these. Uh, a good tip is to find uh, really good examples. Um, good examples for um, what the type of event you wanna do. So, so 
there's probably other organizations having events coming up and find out, uh, you know, what are they using? If, and if they're using the platform you want to use, then maybe participate in the event and see what it looks like, uh, see how it goes. Um, definitely there's best practices and documentation out there. Um, so finding that uh, and, and looking at that is good. And then, uh, you know, retaining an expert, like we produce virtual events and we partner with a lot of different organizations. So that can help too. They can maybe, if you find uh, an agency, they can get you jumpstarted in the right direction. And then definitely practice using the platform. And a lot of our clients are going as far as to having sort of a rehearsal, almost like a dress rehearsal. Um, and it's, that's nice because many of these dress rehearsals, all the participants can, can get together and, and just do a quick run through maybe of the different parts of the event. Um, and many times we record that too. We record that run through too. And that gives the participants uh, an opportunity to see ahead of time what it's going to look like for the people um, attending the event. And that gives them some important insight on what they may, may want to change. Uh, I recently did, um, I actually recently did an event with uh, uh, an event for a large national nonprofit. And actually Jane Fonda was part of this event, which is really cool. I don't know if I'm a Jane Fonda fan. I don't know if any of you are, but uh, it was pretty cool. Uh, Jane Fonda was very much into the rehearsal. She was like, you know, she comes from Hollywood in the acting world. And she's like, we need to rehearse and we need to, you know, try these different things out. And um, this organization had never done a virtual event and they were extremely nervous about it. So it was great. And, um, and the event, the event went, went great. Um, one, one thing was funny. She said, uh, she could tell, I think that people are nervous and she said, well, if you're nervous, that's good. Cause if you're nervous, it means you care, you know, what you're doing, you feel is important. So, um, but doing sort of a dry run rehearsal, those types of things will help with that. Um, I'm seeing some questions are coming in. We'll, we'll take a little pause here and at the end of sections and answer some questions. And then there will be dedicated Q and A at the end. So post event, uh, actions. We talked a little bit about that. Um, these virtual events can really um, get your organization a lot of interest, right? It can bring in new people. It can help strengthen uh, relationships with existing people in kind of your network. So uh, continue to really uh, continue to engage with uh, participants that are highly engaged. Um, so definitely consider having your virtual event up for maybe a longer period of time than when it was live. Consider doing the on-demand versions. And then hopefully, if your event goes really well, you're gonna gain a certain amount of sort of momentum and content around it. And reusing that uh, can help get more bang for the buck and can, uh, keep driving those actions that you want to do, whether it's donate, volunteer, um, whatever. Um, so a next uh, very important part of planning is really the team, right? Uh, we talked a, a little bit about how there's a lot of moving parts to these virtual events usually. So be mindful of building a really good team. Be mindful of, of overloading staff with too many things to pay attention to and too many little details. So it really helps best if you kind of can uh, designate roles, right? Designate certain roles. So this person is going to be kind of in charge of working with the sponsors and, and all the uh, sponsors and getting their content, their video, if they're going to talk or something, kind of dealing with that. Um, and perhaps one person who's kind of working with the donate, your donation partner, your donation platform, getting your auctions ready if there's auctions or however you're going to collect money doing the donation stuff. Kind of try to split up the workload. It takes a lot more than you probably think to execute these. Um, having a good host or if you're going to have an MC uh, is great for events. It's really great for virtual events. And you can usually find there's people out there, of course, who, who they're different personalities, maybe in your community or industry or your area. And they, they do a lot of, you know, live events and, and a lot of them are transitioning to doing hosting for virtual events too. So that helps if you have a really cool kind of charismatic host that's um, can really get people excited and engaged when your event's happening. Um, kind of keeping the excitement going and that energy going is a little bit harder in the virtual space right? Because you're not in a room all together. So the host can really help. Um, another note too about kind of how much work these take and, and, and splitting that work up. This is just a picture I took of my desk of, of running a virtual event. And I was only one of four people 
helping run this event. And this is how much stuff I had to pay attention to uh, just during this one hour. This was a, a fundraising event. They usually do live in a large space with, you know, a hundred or so people. And we did it as a YouTube stream. So left the, my screen here, I have a 34 inch, you know, ultra wide screen. And while this event was going on left to right, I had the YouTube stream up, making sure the YouTube system's okay. It's all working. The picture's looking good. It sounds good. Then I had my script and all my notes of what's supposed to happen when. Then I have the streaming software, uh, OBS up, where I'm monitoring what's going on, uh, going out to YouTube, what's streaming. Then I have the Zoom participants window so I can manage the people who are coming in and out of this virtual event and talking and stuff. Then I have the actual Zoom video window, which I'm capturing all that content to stream out. And then I have my, my microphone and, and headset where I am actually also talking privately to other people through Zoom. Uh, the audience watching can't hear me on YouTube, but I'm sort of directing and talking and coordinating people. Uh, so just what I have to do, there's a lot to pay attention to. So splitting up the workload between your staff is definitely helpful. Um, so I'm gonna actually take one small break, look at these questions. We do have some questions coming in. Um, considering using Instagram Live, I, I have seen a couple events going through Instagram Live um, for a virtual farm tour. That could be tricky to do. Um, I would especially test that out, be wary of how well your device and stuff can stream and keep connected to Instagram so you don't have hiccups in there. <laughs> <clears throat> um, also, um, not a lot of my clients have a huge Instagram audience, but perhaps you do. Um, so keep, keep in mind where your audience is. You know, if the audience you're trying to reach is mostly here, Facebook or mostly Instagram or mostly somewhere, just be mindful. You know, you would hate to, Instagram is something you have to have an account for to use and access. So just make sure the majority of your people are going to be able to get to your content easily. Red flags on platforms. Um, I think that's a question about red flags on platforms. Um, definitely for platforms, be wary of pricing and how expensive it can get. It's tricky because um, there's, it seems like a lot of the virtual event platforms and things, and even like Zoom, which wasn't really designed to be at first, you know, a virtual event platform. There's a lot of nickel and diming happening that, um, you know, okay, you can, have, you can have this event, but it can only be this long. You have to pay more to have it over this amount of time. Or it can only be 50 attendees. You have to pay more to get the package for 200 attendees. So there's all these different costs. So I would say definitely research the costs with your platform. Um, we had a question about the team. How many people ideally would you have on a virtual event team? That could vary a lot. I would say look at the workload and, and split it up appropriately to the workload. So it, let's say during your virtual event, you're going to have a silent auction or things people can buy and you're going to have donations, a donation kind of call, call to donations. Um, if that system takes a lot to manage, um, maybe have someone dedicated to that you know, and kind of figure out how many people you need based on the different compo moving components and parts. Uh, sometimes their clients are working with a donation or auction platform and they actually, that comes with support. That's part of what they're paying for. So they actually, that, that service, that company has a team member on it. And then maybe you don't need to dedicate a whole person to that. So it's going to kind of depend upon the workload and every event's a little different. Um, a big part of what we do for planning too is event documentation. And most of my clients are already pretty familiar, familiar with creating this sort of run of show document and kind of um, doing that, which is, which is pretty good, um, pretty good. But usually what we create for documentation is actually a lot more detailed. Um, it's sort of a minute by minute uh, approach, whereas your typical... Um, show flow might just have a big block for uh, awards, right? This is when the awards are happening. Uh, but we will break ours down to minute by minute. This person introduces this award, then this person accepts. And it kind of goes through like that because if we're sort of directing what's happening, controlling what everyone sees on the screen every minute, um, if, if, if the event runs like that and it's detailed like that, um, and very well sort of executed and organized. You need that level of detail. Um, 
And it's a really good idea to, once you have your sort of event script and documentation done, to test it somewhat. Uh, at the very least, uh, test transitions. That's where we see that things happen. Uh, when it goes from the keynote to a talk and then there's a breakout rooms or something, those transition points, that's usually where things go wrong. So you may not be able to do a dry run or test your script and do the whole thing. Say it's a three-hour event. You may not do that, uh, be able to get everyone together to do that because that's almost like doing your event twice. But at least test important transitions. Um, uh, and of course, avoid at all costs last-minute changes. Um, last-minute small detail changes can actually have a big impact. You'd be surprised. So for instance, let's say you're running something on Zoom um, and you have a couple co-panel hosts and say one of the panelists uh, gets a new laptop or is using a different laptop on the day of the event. They may be logged into a different Zoom account and now you no longer know who they are in the participants list. Let's say they use their wife's computer or something or, or whatever and then their name shows up as something different. So small details like that can actually impact your event. So try not to have last minute changes uh, small and small details and things like that changing last minute. Just as an example, here's kind of a typical script. So this was for an event that was this organization's sort of annual main get together, right? Which they could not cancel. They really need to do that. They had already sold the sponsorships, already signed people up. They, so what we did is this event was primarily run through their website and Zoom. So they had a website uh, with pages dedicated to the schedule. Here's everything that's happening. Uh, and only members and people who had paid could get to that page. And then it was basically a list of Zoom links. So um, in this script, you'll see this is a Google Doc we created for this. Each day of the event, this is a three-day event, each day has its own tab in the script. And every minute here is accounted for of what is supposed to be on the screen and what's supposed to be happening. So this is a typical script that our staff uses to execute the event on the day. And then this is done well ahead of time. The client can see exactly how it's going to run. So the columns we have vary a little bit depending upon the event type. The main columns are time. What time is this line item happening? Uh, we have a column for concurrent. That means is this concurrently happening with another item? With this particular uh, event, people could choose to do different tracks or choose different meetings based on different subjects. So we had things happening at the same time. Um, and then it has sort of the description of what's happening. Then it says, what is on screen? What is supposed to be on screen? This person's webcam, this person's presentation, whatever it is. Then we have a reference file. That's if we're showing a video or showing a sponsor image or play, playing back some kind of pre-recorded thing. We have a, a link to what we're going to be showing so the client can see that ahead of time in case there's some kind of mistake. Oh, this sponsor pulled out. We need to change this image to this other one. Uh, then we have the host and the co-host, uh, their names, but it's actually also linked to their email. This is important because for the Zoom platform, sort of the host, co-host, panelists, that kind of settings, those stuff are based on the email address of the Zoom account that they're logging in with. So we have that linked there. And then we have release. Did we have a signed release? They were going to record these, use them later for marketing. So do we have a release on file for them? And then record it. Are we going to record this? Yes or no. Uh, they chose to record some sessions and not others. So that's kind of a typical uh, uh, a thing. So something that is important for scripts and important for making things happen. Um, here's an example. Here's an example of why the scripts and the coordinating of the staff and the script and the time is really important. This is a virtual event that had a lot of pre-recorded video content. Uh, it had um, a lot of graphics. And what we did was, even though this event a lot of the content was pre-recorded. We brought in live auction data and live donation data uh, that was in real time happening. Uh, so we have to coordinate when that has to show up and all that was in our script. And so the staff running the donation system knows we're gonna be showing this at this time so they know that they have that ready. So we could pull that in through our streaming system and show that. So you notice even at the bottom of this, there's a little built-in uh, there's a little white line at the very bottom of the screen. That's sort of a built-in timing bar too that went across the screen and let that the staff know who is watching, okay, we're almost to the end of where we need to show this. And then we'll queue up the next thing we need to show, which 
which sometimes was like the five top uh, five top items that people are betting on, things like that. So awesome. We're getting a lot more questions. I'm actually going to switch the polling to here quick. I think we have one more poll. Some more questions coming in. Is there um, research for best times on events, uh, particular panel discussion? So that will um, depend to sort of on your audience, right? It will depend upon your audience, when they normally work. Are they nine to five people? Stuff like that. But also another thing as far as during the day, if you're talking about time of the day, uh, you know, keep in mind those other conflicts with other things that your audience typically does during the day. And then especially... Um, Things like meal breaks, uh, people tend to drop off as things get closer to typical meal times. So scheduling things after meals or well before when people typically eat can help with attendance. Um, stuff like that. Um, also, uh, the length, uh, the length of the event uh, is important. So panel discussions, it's harder to go more than an hour for panels. This person specifically asked about that. Um, Pre-recorded events, have you seen these done successfully? Yes, most of the virtual events that we do, most of them have some pre-recorded content, if not all of it's pre-recorded. Um, so the example you're looking at right now on the screen, actually, that entire event was made up of pre-recorded content, and I'm gonna go into that example a lot more later. But even though that was pre-recorded content, um, it was streamed, you know, streamed live on YouTube at a specific time. And the reason is to have everyone in the audience watching all that at the same time. And then to integrate this live auction and donation data, which ended up being completely worth doing because they, they did actually exceed their goal. And I'll talk a little bit more about the specifics of that, um, about that later. So that's pre-recorded events. Uh, and with sort of the, the systems that we typically use, like I talked about that OBS system, uh, OBS lets us mix pre-recorded and live content all together. So you could start pre-recorded, then go to something that's live, go to something else that's live, go back to pre-recorded, say like a sponsor video, then go back to something that's live. Uh, we are scared to do a live event and are planning a pre-recorded one. Any advice? Um, as I talk about these examples, many of which have pre-recorded content, you'll, you'll get a lot of good advice, I think. Um, how can you use Zoom to show pre-recorded content? Um, you can use Zoom to show pre-recorded content. However, uh, an important tip is that Zoom is not inherently designed for that. Zoom is inherently designed to show your screen, like I'm doing right now, and its um, default is about eight frames per second, which is quite slow. That's fine for like a slideshow, like I'm showing you now, or a presentation. But for showing good, high-quality video, Zoom isn't great for it. You can do that. Uh, there's very specific settings when you click to share your screen. Uh, and you can Google that. Um, Google um, sharing uh, high-quality video through Zoom, and you'll find the tips. But there's extra things you check when you click to share your screen that will share your computer's audio as well. And it will kind of make the frames per second higher, so the video will be less choppy. But I would say... Zoom was not designed for that, for sort of full motion, long periods of video. So keep that in mind. Uh, for some users, depending upon their internet connection, the experience may not be very good. Um, so I covered some of that. Uh, and we'll, we're gonna, so we're talking about, this is good with the next slide is about execution. So we have more questions about that and we'll get into those. Um, so some other execution tips is having sort of a pre-event staging area, like I said, to practice, but also get people together before. So say we're doing a YouTube live stream with six participants. We will typically be set up and running that um, 20 minutes sort of before it's supposed to go live. So you can actually start streaming to YouTube um, through your streaming system, but then there's another button you press in YouTube to actually make that live to the audience. So you can get everyone together, check all microphones, cameras, make sure everything looks good and kind of see what it's gonna look like before you go live. Um, so, and another thing about pre-recorded and live content, I would say that um, pre-recorded content is really good for things that um, would be hard to execute live. 
So mixing pre-recorded and live content strategically is a very important thing, I, I feel like. And then, um, like I said, people need breaks too. So we have this uh, question about consecutive days. Also, there's a question about sort of um, how long events should be. It's important for your execution, build in sort of dead time. I've had a lot of clients say, oh, we wanna have this happening, that happening. we don't want dead time. And I have to remind them, well, people can't sit for six hours. I mean, people are going to need dead time. People will need to go up and use the restroom or get a cup of, you know, cup of coffee. I got my YouTube mug. So uh, rather than have them leave when something important might happen, build in that, that dead time, allow for breaks, and allow enough time for people to have act, uh, complete actions, right? So like I showed that thermometer for the donations previously, we gave a long window of, it was like three to five minutes during that time where there was just music and a couple pictures and that donation bar was up there because people we need, will need time to get out their phone, put in their credit card and, and you know, do the donation and stuff. Another port, important part of execution is have backup plans. I'll show you two specific examples of a backup plan that happened uh, that we had to use. And for the audience, it was flawless. You know, they didn't, they didn't know any, anything. Uh, the, uh, the mind body solution, uh, thing, which was for the participants, totally powered through zoom. Uh, it was a live streamed event though. Um, we knew that some participants did not have the best internet connections. Some people may drop out or come back in or there could be issues. So we actually scheduled and had and planned for extra participants in case someone's phone lost connection or something happened. And that did happen. So people kind of came in and out but we had sort of overbooked the participants. So there was always enough people on the screen to make that interesting, right? The Emma Norton event, we were gonna uh, mix in some live performance, live music at the end. Uh, the musician had a conflict, couldn't do it anymore. So instead we replaced that with a music video uh, that the uh, host of that, the MC of that event had been in. So we had a backup plan.